Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, blimey, what's Welcome to the uh, final session of the day about uh, the showcase. Uh, we have a panel of uh, very uh, distinguished uh, speakers, all of whom are have either been successful academics or practitioners, or in some cases both, um, uh, and who will all speak for about five minutes um, about their reflections on the, both the day and how to collaborate effectively between uh, the arts and humanities research community and the creative and digital uh, community. Um, for about, I'm David Doxty, I'm Chair, Chief Executive of the National Centre for Universities and Business, and I've spent about 25 years in various media companies. Um, and for about a year, I was head of audience research at the BBC, so I'm always interested in my demographics. So I'd quite like to figure out who you are before we tell you who we are. Um, how many academics are in the room? How many people who run businesses or cultural institutions? Well, that's a good smattering. And anybody who's not he who's here under false pretenses and should be somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> he used to work for me, so I understand he's definitely under here under false, false, false pretenses. Right, well, before we started, Frank said, um, this is Frank Boyd, um, who uh, is many things. Uh, Frank said, you know what, why don't you get the audience to tell us what they want? And I thought that was such a radically interactive idea that I'm going to let Frank do it. Go on, Frank. Well, no, what I said to David was, you know, because very often what I do when I'm chairing a panel um, is, you know, the convention is for people to speak and they've prepared remarks which may or may not be relevant to you. Um, so what I very often do is ask, say, so you turned up for this meeting. Why are you here? What is it, I mean, what is it that you want to hear from us? So what are the, what, what are the questions in your mind at the moment? It might help us give us a steer in terms of what we talk about. So we're going round the room, Frank. We're starting over there. <laughs> no, just one or two. I heard a lot of very interesting things said today, but what actions do you think will come out of today? Good, good question. That's a good what question. Actions will come out of today? Someone else? Let's have three or four. Behind you. Hi, the thing I found most useful is when people are talking, talking about relatively small budget projects rather than six and a half million pound. So if there could be a focus on relatively um, cheap projects that we would, or ideas that we could then take back to our institutions, I think that would be useful. Great, very good. Another couple, down here. It's all at the front, what are you doing at the back up there? <laughs> it's um, just, uh, I, I noted in, in a way, there's a gap between the what's, what's going on in this meeting and what happens in a lot of traditional humanities activities. So the question is, does that gap matter? And if so, what do you do about it? Great. Come on, you guys at the back. You can't get away with it. Two, let's have two at the back. Come Over on. here. Uh, my question is about interdisciplinarity and um, fusion, which I've heard a lot about today and has been very welcome, very interesting. How do we see more of that develop and more particularly more co-production in research? Right. Good. Last one. In the middle here. Over here. Oh, very good. <laughs> Judy gets to start with that one. <laughs> right, uh, let's go back to a sadly more conventional structure because I was enjoying that. So, uh, going from here, we've got Judy Simons, we've got Emma Wakeling, we've got Deborah Bull, we've got Frank Boyd and John Hawkins. They can all introduce themselves and do five minutes on their reflections and hopefully pick up some of these themes as you go. I think pick Judy. up rather than necessarily answer some, uh, some of the questions because I've got questions as well that have arisen out of the day. I'm Judy Simons, I'm an emeritus professor at De Montfort University in Leicester, and I am chair of the um, group that has oversight uh, of the four uh, knowledge exchange hubs. And I think from today, well, my, my first reflection really is where, where else can you go and meet Queen Anne and a hologram of Rick Rylance and George Clooney. And I think it's that sort of interaction, that surprising interaction um, of different ideas and different perspectives um, that, that emerges, is one of the things that emerges from today. But I also have got um, questions, I suppose, as well as ideas for opportunities for universities. Um, and my, my first one really relates to your question about the humanities. Um, because I think I saw today that there are opportunities for both arts and humanities. Uh, I think when we started out, certainly with the hubs and a lot of the work with the creative economy, we thought it would be mainly focused 
on the arts, on design, on media production, on film. But in fact, certainly the React Hub, and I don't know if you picked up um, the, the publication from React, shows how it's engaging a lot of traditional humanities scholars, historians, literary scholars, classicists, geographers, um, in partnerships and, and in collaboration um, with commercial enterprises. And so there's work being done on things like Say, the heritage industry, there's a lot of activity there, uh, and the future of the book for literary scholars. And that, to me, is something that is a surprise. Weren't, we weren't necessarily expecting that, when, certainly when I came today. The other thing that is a general reflection on what we've seen emerge across the four hubs, some of which was in evidence today, is actually the way in which the skills base is being broadened um, in uh, the arts and humanities research, and particularly for students and for PhDs. And I don't know how many of you uh, saw that wonderful um, uh, interactive um, imitarium, which is, in fact, a student project uh, and designed by a student um, and, and built by a student. And that, for me, was one of the really fantastic things about today. It was such a strength in its blend of old and new, the way that it looks like something of, of what the butler saw uh, and has got that marvellous sort of early 20th century interior, but in fact is blending that with this sort of blinding new technology. Um, and to me, that is a strength and the sort of opportunity that there is for developing new graduates and new students um, who will come out with skills that are applicable um, across the board and we hope can go, go straight into employment. However, I think there are a number of challenges. Um, one of them is cultural. And again, actually, this relates to your question about, about the humanities, because I think there is still a resistance among a lot of traditional scholars, a lot of traditional humanities scholars, in terms of their willingness to engage with the potential that this sort of activity can release. Um, and so it is notable that although there were some great examples of humanities projects, the emphasis today was very much um, on the arts and, and on, on new media. Um, so, you know, cynicism tends to be the default mode of uh, humanities academics. And I think that whereas science and engineering in universities has really exploited the opportunities for working in partnership, the arts and humanities are much slower to respond to this. And I think that's a cultural barrier that somehow we, we have to break down. How we do it, I don't know, I'm going to ask you this, this question or ask it back to you. I think the other issue was one that's operational. Today was very much about celebration, as Rick said in his opening address, but in fact, when you talk to a number of the people behind um, the work in the hubs, they are experiencing difficulties with university research officers, just in terms of the very clunky systems that exist, the um, failure to respond to the nature and the scale of some of the work that's going on, which a lot of which is, as again somebody um, said, with, with small businesses, often with micro businesses, we're not dealing with huge sums of money. It's a lot of smaller projects, and I think it's how we can get um, university research managers to be more flexible in terms of their approach uh, to these projects. And although often they're quite good at KT, they're much less good at, at knowledge exchange and that sort of dialogic format um, in terms of partnership. And my final question again relates to the way in which a lot of these projects are, are small um, and about the sustainability. Because we've seen that a number of these small enterprises, and a number of you here are from smaller companies, arts groups or, or, or smaller media companies, um, who are quite reliant on the funding that has been provided by the AHRC. That's not going to last forever. 
So my question, which I'm putting back to you and back to the AHRC, is how can we sustain this beyond the life of this funding cycle? How can we genuinely build capacity? And also, how can we disseminate and capture the knowledge that we have and that we're acquiring from, say, a day like today um, and bring that to our colleagues who are less engaged than we are here. I mean, here, we're preaching to the converted. You're all here because you have an interest, a genuine interest in engagement in this. Um, but as you know, if you come from academic institutions, you can be quite isolated. OK, thank you, dear. Terrific. Emma? Thank you. Thank you, Judy. A few points there that I would uh, like to build on. I think I came here today with um, some questions in my head as a funder. Um, I'm an associate director at the Arts Humanities Research Council, and I oversee all of our creative economy projects. Uh, the questions I have, which are the questions I get asked regularly when I'm out and about in universities, is why is the HRC putting so much money, stroke so little money, into, depending on your perspective, into knowledge exchange projects. Um, the other question we get asked is, why, you know, what is the contribution of the arts and humanities? Um, and people who are here this morning listening to David Willits will get a sense of what it is we deal with um, when we work alongside the Science Research Councils, because we are tiny in financial terms compared to them. But we think, and I think today has shown that we really punch above our weight. Um, and I hope that's the message David Willits will have taken away from what he saw today. Um, but why, why do we spend this money on knowledge exchange? And I think today, even I, as somebody who in theory has an overview of all of these projects, have been really taken aback by the scale of what we fund. Um, but the question at the front here was absolutely right, that it is made up of lots of very small-scale projects. And I think, I think that's how it works Best. So one of the challenges for us is to think about what comes next in our knowledge exchange funding. What do we need to do when our investment in the knowledge exchange hubs comes to an end? Um, and what, what are the next steps? And I think that perhaps this, this model of very small scale, cheap, I think was the word you used, projects, is the one we need to follow. But I think the real benefit of working uh, along the model of the hubs has been that you are able to have lots of small-scale projects at relatively low cost individually, um, but within the framework of a hub, you have people responsible for taking that overview and really thinking, reflecting about what they're doing, what works, what doesn't work, um, and taking that learning in, in new directions. And I think that's what we really need to build on today. And I think I would echo... Judy's feeling that, I mean, today has been about showing what we've done with the money, which I think is hugely impressive, um, and celebrating that. But I, I do worry that we, the HRC, don't work hard enough at getting that message out more broadly. And I think we have a fantastic story to tell about the work that all of you are doing, and I don't think we're telling it in a powerful enough way. So that's a question I'd like to put to you. How can we really step up that and I echo your concern that I, we are in this room preaching to the converted and people I suspect came here today knowing, knowing what they were going to get which is great but how do, how do we reach beyond that um, the other thing that really struck me today when Sebastian Conran was speaking was that he had a lot of the answers um, to the question about what is it that the arts and humanities contribute because he used lots of words uh, that really rang bells with me. So it's all about the human perspective. That's exactly what arts and humanities research has to offer. Sebastian talked about design as something that turns science into culture, turns knowledge into experience. He talked about appealing to the emotional as well as the rational. He talked about trust, passion, belief. And I think that's, that's all really valuable values that the arts and humanities bring. And that's something very distinctive that you're not going to get from the sciences. Excellent. Thank you. Deborah? Thank you. So I just find the right page. Um, so uh, my background is in the performing arts, and I worked for a very long time in a big national cultural institution. And latterly, for the last two years, I've worked at King's College London, where I have the 
the, the role of connecting the college with the cultural sector. Um, I'm also a member of council for the AHRC, so I, I say that so you know the kind of perspective that I'm coming at, at this from. There are really, I think, three or four points I wanted to make. The first one is about language. We had the question, what is the creative economy? It's something I decided I'd like a bit more clarity on before I, um, before I came here today. So I did that thing we do, I Googled it. And it was very interesting um, because what came up uh, were some uh, things from some sort of uber, uber organizations, as I call them, AHRC, um, British Council, UNESCO. We found John's uh, book and John's site. Um, but there was very little from organizations referring to themselves as part of the creative economy. Um, but fasc what fascinated me the most, and I get, think I get a prize today for being the only person to mention Wikipedia in such an august... Uh, sorry, there is no Wikipedia page about the creative economy. But there is a Wikipedia page about everything known to man, but there is not one about the creative economy, which I found completely fascinating. Creative industries, yes, but not creative. So there's a job for when you go home tonight to write that up. Um, and I, I just... <laughs> I found that um, quite, quite fascinating that it was a term which had been so absorbed in perhaps academic and policy circles but had not been absorbed within the bits of the industry that I think I understand make up the creative economy. I did come up uh, with something in, in the UNESCO report which is from, I think from Michael Keane which said uh, the creative is a mysterious animal uh, found in many habitats. Um, policy makers talk it up, academics are inclined to talk it down um, while artists and creative practitioners are ambivalent. They're basically just happy to be talked about at all, um, which, which, I, which I also rather liked. Um, and I think I might be being slightly pedantic here, but I do think that this lack of a common agreed language um, and a common understanding of these terms might present an inherent challenge to the creative and cultural sectors, as I probably call them, engaging completely effectively with, 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 with academia on this question. Um, and that brings me to my second point. I'm really glad you asked people to put their hands up because I'm glad there are cultural organisations here. I hadn't clocked that there were quite so many. Um, and I, I do think if cultural activities are at the core of the creative industries and therefore the creative economy, as I understand, then there is a need to engage more effectively with cultural organizations and arts organizations, not just the creative industries. And I know, you know, we could be splitting hairs here because we don't quite understand what all these terms are, but I'm making a general point. Um, according to DCMS data, the music and performing arts sector has grown by 0.9 billion. And Arts Council England estimates that for every pound it invents, it invests four pounds more goes back to the UK economy. So what I'm saying there is that music and the performing arts are clearly a considerable part of the creative economy. Uh, but like many of the art forms supported by the Arts Council, they don't generally ha have access to a research capability, nor often do they have a strong academic tradition. I mean, if I take the example of, of dance here, where I'm most familiar, it's a very new academic tradition. Very few ballet companies or opera houses would have a research function. Museums and galleries do, but performing arts organisations don't. So it does, um, it does set up a challenge around connecting effectively, um, and I'll come on to that. I should also say Arts Council recently has reduced its own research capabilities within its funding cuts. So um, again, the, the, the potential for synergies across council to council are reduced because of this lack of a common language. Um, so the third point I wanted to make was about the challenges and opportunities of connecting academic communities with the cultural and creative uh, communities, which is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis now. Um, we, and we heard a lot of this from Conran uh, uh, earlier. Uh, the, I, there was a question about interdisciplinarity. Culture and the arts, uh, they are a fantastic vehicle for interdisciplinarity because they are by their very nature interdisciplinary. Every art form involves several art forms automatically. They're great ways to, in, to demonstrate impact because of the potential for culture to connect with wider audiences. They also, the thing that um, Sebastian Conran said which interested me and surprised me was that when he put his designers in front of the public at Showcase 14, whatever it's called, um, wow, the public had some great thoughts and questions. Well, of course they did. That's why we do public engagement. <laughs> That's why public engagement is so central to what we do. And of course, uh, the arts uh, are a great way to engage the public in a cycle of iteration, feedback, and reiteration, which drives new processes and new thinking. And then artists, I think artists and cultural organizations are 
brilliant at provoking innovation because they see the world quite differently. They deal with intuitive knowledge. They take risks of imagine, uh, risks of um, leaps of imagination and and, f and and leaps of faith. They're very comfortable with risk, and they you know if this isn't too fanciful, they see the world not as it is but as it could be. They're aspirational. So I think if you put um, academic rigor with artistic intuition, if you like, you can spark new ways of thinking and doing, and that's what you know, we're all engaged in here. Um, so, I, and, and I think there are, of course, many things we know which the academic sector can give the cultural sector in terms of access to evidence, um, new perspectives on um, new ways of doing things, access to knowledge, and so on. But there are challenges, and we could talk more about these. Time scales, I mean, you would think nothing of a research grant that was two years or even longer. For most artists, they're not working at that time scale. They've got six months, and then it's on and done, and they're on to the next thing. There's a thing about durational focus you know, the ability to have your head down for such a long time, which um, typically I think artists tend to, you know, leap up and do a, a bit sooner, perhaps. Um, there are different positions on what's actually needed, that um, evidence versus advocacy. It's something Andy Pratt talked about in the session just before this. Empirical knowledge and intuitive knowledge can be quite uneasy bedfellows from time to time, and arts advocates can be passionate about what they've seen and what they believe, um, but many anecdotes do not make a, an evidence base um, and the cultural sector is, is becoming a bit uncomfortable with that because uh, we'd, we'd like it to be the case that they do. Um, so uh, I think in terms of actions, what ca could we do? I think better linkage between this research council and the arts council, but other research councils too, social, um, medical, health. Um, better mapping of what's going on outside the AHRC because there's a lot of connectivity that isn't AHRC funded, but I think we need to understand it. And then finally, this is my last point, the creative co economy depends on creativity. And it sounds like an obvious thing to say, but the curriculum changes, which I know are not our direct interest, we need to be deeply concerned that the curriculum changes risk a generation coming through who don't, haven't tapped into their own creativity. Um, and Gove's recent speech, um, he talked about an apartheid between practical and knowledge. Actually, what we believe in the cultural sector, there's an apartheid between academic and creativity. Um, and the, 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 he talked in his speech about imagining the jobs of the future, but said that that was about knowledge, that was about giving knowledge. Yes, of course, but creativity is about how you apply knowledge differently and the role of arts and culture in tap, uh, un, undo, um, undoing, uh, unleashing that in young people is really critical. And so, I mean, uh, uh, coming back round full circle, I think, my final concern is about language, that when politicians talk about arts, culture, and creativity in terms of education, they use the words as interchangeably as we do creative economy, industries, and cultural. Um, and actually, arts, creativity, and culture are not the same thing. They're connected, but they're not the same thing. And if we cannot explain that to government, then I'm not sure who's going to. Thank you, Deborah. Frank? Um, OK, so um, I think my first reflection on the day was, um, I thought the day got off to a really good start, because I got an opportunity to ask David Wirtz a question, um, in which, picking up on his, uh, his point about um, the, that the AHRC should find ways of working with the Technology Strategy Board, and in my question I implied that, um, you know, I've been lobbying the Technology Strategy Board to do this and they weren't really listening. Um, unfortunately, there were two of my key clients from the Technology Strategy Board in the room, one of whom then texted me to say, but it's in our strategy, we agreed that we've been agreeing this all year. So I... That's, you know, one of my worries is that I've now completely screwed up my relationship with the Technology Strategy Board as a result of today. Um, although, actually, I managed to get... I think, it, although I think that it is in that area that I think the most interesting um, activity in what I've seen today has been most encouraging. Um, as I said on the panel I was on earlier, I think, from my perspective, one of the most important things that the AHRC has done um, in the last couple of years is the work on the, on the Brighton Fuse and to provide, and, and, and provide, by doing that research, to provide real evidence of the, the importance of people with arts and humanities skills um, in creative, digital and IT businesses to drive growth. Um, and that's you know, that is, that is, that it is such a useful um, argument now to be able to make, to be able to point that to that evidence. Um, and 
what's very encouraging, I think, is that um, despite what I implied in my question, the, the, the bodies like the Technology Strategy Board um, are listening and do understand that and do see um, the, ne the need to do what um, Eric Schmidt in his speech at the Edinburgh Television Festival two years ago um, described as being necessary, which is to bridge the gap between the two cultures, between what he, what he characterised as lovies and boffins, um, in order to drive growth. Um, which I think picks up on your point about language, actually, because, you know, I've been running um, innovation workshops, bringing people together from these sectors um, for about 20 years now, and um, I realised after a while that essentially what I'm doing is running a language school. And, you know, you're bringing, you're bringing people together. I used to say that, you know, what you're doing, I mean... Schmidt said lovies and boffins. I used to say it's, you know, the three tribes here. There's geeks, lovies, uh, and barra boys. And until you get these people, you know, who wear different clothes, drink in different pubs, speak different languages, have different cultures, don't really like each other very much, until you get these people working together effectively, you know, you're, you're not really going to be able to drive innovation and growth in this in the country. And I think um, it's great to see that the AHRC is moving into that space, and there's a lot of evidence that, of that here today. I mean... Um, David, I've just asked to be the um, chair of my, the new advisory board for my part of the um, integrated KTN. I mean, for those of you who don't know, I'm the, the, I, I run one of 16 knowledge transfer networks currently funded by the TSB, um, covering everything from sort of nanotechnology, biosciences, um, chemistry innovation to the creative industries and design. And we're all merging into one organisation on April the 1st, which I hope is not a significant date. Um, and I, I, I asked David to be the chair of the bit that I'm going to be running, the foot, you know, which is covering digital economy, creative industries, and design. Um, and we had a, a first kind of informal meeting of, uh, to, to talk about that advisory structure, uh, which Rick Rylance came to. And at the time I said, you know, I, I, I think, and I still think this is true, that, 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 that the relation, particularly in the creative industries, the relationship between the research academic research and industries, particularly, you know, there are 180,000, according to DCMS, there are 180,000 creative businesses in the UK. Most of those are micro-enterprises, you know, they're SMEs. The relationship between academic research and those businesses is mostly broken, I think. Um, I don't think it works nearly as well as it could. Clearly there are, you know, and, and clearly I think projects like the Knowledge Exchange Hubs, you know, there are other examples of good practice. But there is still a gap there. And mostly these are very lean organisations who don't have the time and they don't understand how they, you know, they may have been to university and they understand what the, the, the skills, the point of university in terms of skills, but they don't really understand how they can engage with academic research. And I, still, I think there is still a big job to do there in terms of, of, of bridging that gap, which I certainly hope that, you know, my KTN in the future can, can, can be a large part of... Um, of achieving, and so, so, so but I, you know, I think a lot of the conversations I've had today, um, and a lot of what I've seen today, has encouraged me that that you know that, that we can move in that direction. So, um, I, th I think the, I mean, the other thing that I think is quite exciting at the moment, and this is, um, as I say, you know, one of the things we did as as this new organisation, this new KTN, was we had our first meeting of the 120 people who will be the initial staff complement. And I found myself in a room full of people from science backgrounds, you know, chemists, people with PhDs in research chemistry, you know, bioscience, sciences, energy generation, and so on. Um, and what was really interesting was I'd, I'd ask them to, um, uh, each KTN, each group, to bring three objects with them and tell a story about it. Uh, and I sat on one, and there was a woman there from the Biosciences KTN who had a Kit Kat. Um, and she talked about all the elements of Kit Kat that were relevant to what they did. Um, so from the fact that they're doing work into the, um, uh, the genetic algorithms of barley in order to improve barley crops and therefore get a better wafer in a Kit Kat or indeed get better Scotch whiskey. Um, the, help, the work they're doing around the health-giving properties of chocolate um, but then she got into talking about design and cultural heritage, you know, and the design of, of, of Kit Kat. You know, the, the Kit Kat bar you eat now is completely different to the one that I ate when I was a child in the 60s. Um, but it looks the same. Um, so there's sort of the issues. And so, so even across to, you know, the biosciences KTN, issues of design, cultural heritage are an important part of the way that they 
um, do, do, do R&D, the way that they, they, they develop products. I think, so, you know, the, the opportunities for people coming from the arts and humanities disciplines to have an impact in other parts of the economy, not just elsewhere in the creative industries, but right across the economy, is enormous. And I think, you know, I, I really hope that we are able to work together effectively over the next, um, the next year or more or, or longer in making that happen. And one, I mean, in terms of, you know, the question about actions, I mean, one specific action that I suggest, um, and I now I actually in my making my apologies to the people from the TSB um, earlier today. Um, what I ran past them was the idea of bringing together um, people from the AHRC, from other research councils, the EPSRC, um, with people from uh, the creative industries, with people from the TSB, in a kind of in a in a in a, in a relatively you know maybe two or three days, but for a, to do an intensive lab to say let's create a roadmap of what the innovation agenda is for the content industries over the next three years or five years, and, and maybe try and look out beyond. And and how can the research councils work with the technology strategy board um, in order to provide? the boost, you know, the necessary boost along that roadmap for industry. Um, I think that's quite a doable project. It's never, I don't think, I'm, I'm, as far as I'm aware, it's never been done before. There are other industries, you know, the aerospace industry has a roadmap, has a technology roadmap over the next, you know, 20 years. Um, that, that's where Moore's Law came from, from doing that exercise in the 60s so that for, for the sort of computer science industry. So that's, I think that's one very practical thing that we could do as, as, as a next step. Um, because at the moment, you know, and this comes from my, my perception of, I don't know how it is with the research councils, but with the TSB, somebody said, I was in a meeting the other day, where somebody said, well, so how does the TSB work out where it's going to spend its money? And the person next to me said, well, what they do is that. And it's kind of true. Um, so I think that's something very practical that we could do um, with the AHRC, with other research councils, as a next step. And within that... I think, you know, because one of the, as I say, most of my members are SMEs, the real challenge is to find a way of, 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 of creating funding opportunities to build platforms that, that, that perhaps do have relatively small sums of, of, of cash in them, but that actually do allow SMEs to participate and to, gain, to benefit from, from the research, from the, from the funding. Um, John. Yeah, um, I used to work in, in television when I first came across David, uh, and then film. Um, and then recently I've been thinking about this vexing issue <laughs> of creativity and innovation. Um, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by um, congratulating the HRC on a very, very good showcase. Really, really good, really impressive. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the food was good too, really good food. Um, it did occur to me sometime during the morning, what would this look like if this was a showcase on creative economy research run, organised and funded by industry? That would be an interesting event. What does industry think of what we do? Not just the SMEs that we keep on talking about, but the, the major players in each of the sectors. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'm glad the Chinese are here. Professor Wang and others, it's good to see some friends of mine from Shanghai. Um, I've had, I have to say, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm an alcoholic, and my name is John Hawkins, I'm an alcoholic, but I, I do get a bit of partnership fatigue. <laughs> everybody is inventing partnerships. Probably everybody here is a member of at least five or six networks and partnerships and dialogues, and sometimes I get the impression that just inventing, setting up, establishing and financing, they're very expensive and they're hard to manage. Another partnership is sometimes seen as an end in itself. And I don't think it is. Um, they can lead to something useful. They can just be an end in itself and clog up the system. I was asked about what is a creative economy, a question I normally duck. Um, but I think I have to say something about it. Um, and I will answer it by uh, in my normal way, which is to say there are three parts to it. There's the individual being creative, and in my book, everybody is born with a creative aptitude. And if they're not, if they're not born with that aptitude, then, then they're, not, they're not normal. 
It's the mark of a normal, healthy human being. Then there's the social circumstances that allow them to express, talk about, gossip, share their creativity, follow it if they want to, um, say yes to ideas, no to ideas. And then some people, relatively small proportion, but an increasing proportion, then use that creativity and their talents and their developed skills in their own business. <coughs> it, it, it is at the moment a relatively small proportion of the, of the population. Um, and I divide the creative economy into four main sectors. There's arts and culture, um, there's media, there's design, and innovation. So creative can lead to a beautiful poem or a painting or a, or a, a, a choreography um, or set design, or it can lead to um, a new app. They both have elements of creativity within them. Um, each country has a different definition. I'm not going to do a Wikipedia page. I love Wikipedia. I adore it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I'll tell you afterwards why. Um, uh, we in this country are good at the creativity. We are good at the social conditions. We are not so good at turning our ideas into companies that scale. Um, this is a very contestable um, point, but there's a general feeling that Germany now has Europe's biggest creative economy, followed by France, UK in third place. Government will never admit that. Understand that we want them to campaign for and promote our creative economy. But the facts of the size of the marketplace <coughs> and the industries inside those countries do suggest that they are now number one and two in Europe. Um, uh, why are we here? I, 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 um, I want to talk very briefly about this question of small budgets. Um, and I want to relate it to the question that came up in the first session about um, big institutions having problems working with um, individuals. And SMEs is the wrong word. I mean, one or two people together, three or four people together, five, six people together. Uh, back down to two or three people working together, lots of independent, freelance, self-employed, sole traders working together. Um, and I, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use that as a metaphor for what I think is a fundamental difference between the worlds of the university, which are basically institutional. You join straight from university, so to speak. You go there, you get security of some sort, you get an institutional support, you get a very, very high level of cost. You follow one recruitment pattern. You are promoted for one reason. Your standards of what interests you, what gives you um, pleasure, uh, what amuses you, um, what makes you good, are fundamentally different from the same things in the world of business. And government itself, again, is completely different, although more like the universities. Uh, the, 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 I, I have. I have grown up and worked in the business world most of my life with the odd foray into a university. I'm always struck by the fundamental differences between those two worlds. And I think we have to acknowledge that. We, we talk a lot about how let's get together and work together and that would be such fun. And it's sometimes desirable. Actually, sometimes it isn't desirable. Um, and I think we have to be very realistic about the difference between the institutional world of the university this is the same in every country. Um, and the role of the individual living off their wits, trying to do something beautiful, trying to do something remarkable, trying to do whatever at that moment interests them. And as someone said, the timescales of creative people are often terrifyingly short. You've got to seize the moment and develop it and work very hard. Quite different from that of an institution. Um, my final point is something that has come to me. I've, um, I'm a, I've got a research center based in Shanghai, funded by the Shanghai government. And I've just become a senior fellow at the Drucker um, Management School in, out, just outside of LA. <coughs> and I am struck in both places by the, the energy and the ambition of people in Shanghai and the Claremont outside of LA. The, 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 the level of comfort they have in what they're doing and the level of far-reaching ambition and their ability to move from 
place to place very quickly. When I go to a British university, I don't get that. I think, to some extent, the universities, and I think this may be particularly true in the arts and humanities, I've heard Willis talk about this a few years ago um, and say this, that the arts and humanities departments, the faculties, the researchers have not got the confidence in their own disciplines and their subjects and their skills and their relevance that they do have in other countries. And this is not directly relevant to what we're talking about here, but I think it lies somewhere as part of the problem, and we have to address it if we're going to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, John. Very good rising statement. Sadly, we have run out of time. Um, <laughs> just but we started five minutes late, so with the panel's indulgence, I'll just nick five minutes just for questions and comments. And who's got questions and comments? Could you say who you are and where you're from just to help? If I, if I say where I'm from, it'll make it clear what the question is. Um, uh, Oriana Badley, University of the Arts, uh, Dean of Research, University of the Arts, London. Um, it, it strikes me that in a lot of your conversations, there was an, almost kind of an implicit um, separation of the idea of um, creativity as itself an academic subject. And I feel when you look around this room, there are a lot of my colleagues here who work in institutions that actually for which the arts is the curriculum, um, institutions of uh, learning and research and development in arts and design, not of the creative industries as in partnership with other disciplines. And I think one of the key areas where within the UK, maybe we're not doing enough, is somehow or other getting those kinds of collaborations across arts and humanities subjects and a recognition of the real value that research by artists and by designers can have in relation to research by those in the humanities and other, and, and other art subjects could be having. And, and I know that the AHRC understands it, they see a lot of the work we're doing, but I did feel that it was almost as though we were setting up this completely artificial divide between what constitutes the creative and what constitutes the academic. Very, very good point. Any other questions, comments? Down here, down the front here. Two at the front. Man, the blue shirt should go first. Hi, it's Alan Shechner, Plymouth University, and it's probably not the uh, right context for this, but in terms of what you raised, Emma, in uh, the question of what the arts and humanities bring, um, is it worth revisiting what Gustav Metzger talked about when he called for an art strike? No. I'm not <laughs> suggesting that we necessarily go through that, but to, to try to visualise what, to David Willits and his, his compatriots, what uh, our society would be like if there were an art strike might be a useful strategy to move forward. That's a good thought experiment anyway. <laughs> Great thought. This is a comment rather than a question. Catherine Harper, University of Portsmouth. Um, in Ireland, where I come from, universities are championed as cultural drivers and they lead on relationships with business. I'm worried here that a number of times there have been references to a sense of universities almost servicing business. And I think we need to think of a more equal and um, useful way of describing that relationship. So perhaps that's something we could take away as homework. Yes, very, good, very good homework. One last one. Gosh, you got the last chance. Right at the back there. Um, hello, Philip Graham, and it's not an Irish conspiracy here. Uh, Queen, <laughs> Queen's University in Belfast, but I was ex uh, executive director of Oral. And I was actually struck by some of the comments that Professor Judy actually made about thinking that uh, maybe some of the research support offices do not give <coughs> the attention that they actually do to arts and humanities and these particular areas and creative industries than they do to other activities. I actually think that's a wee bit disingenuous because I know that most of the universities I know and deal with do do that. Uh, and I've got responsibilities for, being, for dealing with external relationships uh, on arts and humanities and social sciences. Where I do find there is a problem at the moment uh, with the AHRC is that the lack of programmes that we have that we haven't got stuff in this, you're actually in the digital area. Uh, most people are just going to responsive mode stuff. Uh, we, a lot of the programs are closing down 31st of March. We've got nothing else to apply for. So there seems to be that we are actually looking for 
other areas of funding, which could be NESTA or British Academy or wherever it happens to be, but there doesn't seem to be anything in the AHRC, despite the big programmes that we we're actually talking about this morning, that are actually open to us now. So I think we're actually hitting a bit of a, a brick wall on that one. Well, I think I'll have to novel Rick over drinks. Um, I'm afraid that's it. Uh, Karl Marx came up with the first and best impact statement where he said that um, historically philosophers' job was to understand the world and other points to change it. Um, and I think that we have a right and a responsibility to change the world. My PhD was on a French philosopher and theologian called Paul Ricoeur. And I hope, as I enter my late 50s, that I wouldn't be sitting in an office just trying to do another footnote to Paul Ricoeur. I'd be out there trying to work on truth and reconciliation. Um, we can do so much out of both arts and humanities and creative and cultural industries to change the world, and let's do it. I'm going to pass to Rick to close off. Uh, thank you, David, for that re resounding speech. And to all our panellists, uh, I won't detain you long because drinks are waiting. So just really a round of thanks. A round of thanks to all of our speakers today, not just the group in front of you. Uh, a round of thanks to those people in the HRC and in this building who've been organising this event so wonderfully, uh, particularly perhaps Danielle and Philip from the HRC who took a lead role, but there are plenty of others. And then finally, thanks to everybody who's contributed to this event, particularly those in the hubs, uh, in the centres, in the various projects who produce such galvanising and inspiring work. So uh, I think we should all enjoy now a collective hand clap uh, <laughs> for not just these folk on the stage, but also everybody in the auditorium. So 